Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. And this is our uh, annual DVD catch-up show. Uh, nothing really hit theaters this week, so uh, we decided to take a look back at some of the movies that uh, we've seen over the year and that we did not get to review. So uh, we have The Invitation, which was uh, Justin's pick, Hunt for the Wilder People, which was mine, uh, For the Love of Spock, you can guess who uh, did that one. Who? Whatever you mean. <laughs> That's Joe. And then, uh, as usual, we give uh, Justin a, a second one. He uh, sees, you know, more of uh, the the home media mov- movies during a year than we do. So the whaling uh, will also be discussed. So uh, first up is the invitation, uh, one that you guys can find on Netflix uh, or, of course, on DVD as well. Justin, let's hear about it. <laughs> uh, Logan Marshall Green plays Will, a man still recovering from the death of his son. Invited to a dinner party hosted by his ex, played by Tammy Blanchard. Though, as the true motives of the evening actually come to light, lines get drawn, and nothing is exactly what it seems. This is probably the movie this year that I have the most divisive feelings about. I kind of am calling it, at the moment, this year's Ex Machina. For a lot of the, of the good of Ex Machina, and also in one of the biggest issues I have with this movie. Hmm. So for about the first two-thirds, I think it does a very good job of the setup. I think it does a very good job of getting us into the characters. And the way the the motivations and the actual like main dilemma comes into play is really well-paced. You can genuinely get behind the character. You really feel for him. And there are a few moments where it honestly does tug on the heartstrings. With that said, where does it fall apart? And the answer is the same as with Ex Machina, Act 3, where that pace, that interesting analysis of very, very deep and interesting characters goes into straight-up crazy, violent thriller that just throws everything at the screen, hoping something works, and then goes into a completely bizarre twist that makes it go into an even stranger angle that honestly went from what I thought was going to be one of the best movies I saw this year to me just asking myself, this is good, but what exactly did I just watch? And it was sort of for that reason that I wanted to bring this to the table because I, I still am tr- I'm still meditating on that, still trying to wrap my head around all that, and I thought getting a, getting a second and even third perspective might, uh, might give me some, might throw out some interesting insights. So I'm curious to see where you where you two stood on this one. Well, I mostly enjoyed it. Um, I, I agree that the pace of the first hour and a half, pretty much, as opposed to the last like ten or fifteen minutes, is very different. But I sort of liked the the slow build of it. Now I was a little bit confused when I saw on Wikipedia this is marketed as a horror thriller because hmm. I did not find it to be that. I mean, thriller, okay. Oh yeah, definitely drama. A yes. Horror I wasn't getting from it. But with that in mind, I sort of thought at the beginning that it seemed like maybe a your next kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, different different groups of people converge on the house. I also thought a little bit of it's a disaster as well. In um, a weird way. But in, yes. in sort of a weird way. Obviously, that's a very, you know, uh, broad comedy, and this is not that at all. But I thought that the characters were interesting. One of my bigger issues with it was... I didn't really think the small talk dialogue was at all believable. Hmm. The lines seemed very phony. Um, I didn't really think they were real people in those Hmm. scenes. Um, But then once they started uh, getting into the meat of the story, really, I would say probably maybe when they watched the video. Probably, um, yeah. Actually, I would say even before that. I would say when a certain person gets smacked in the face. (laughs) Hmm. Um, okay. Then I, I sort of was like, okay, well, that was unexpected and the first thing probably that was yes. um, in the movie. Yeah. Uh, I did have to think of uh, a great scene from Joe's film, Sacrifice, oh. at the beginning oh, no. when, when a couple happens to be driving down the road and may hit something. Uh, well, my script was written first. Well, I know so. that. I, I'm sure of so, that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there you go. But it, it, and, I, and I saw your movie first, too. Oh, wow. Um, but, yeah, so that <laughs> nice little throwback. Oh. Um, but I, for the most part, I, I enjoyed it. I think the ending is 
the best part. I mean, I think there was a lot of uh, oh snap moments to keep it clean. Oh snap! That's not what I was saying. Well, it's definitely but... <laughs> <laughs> the the filtered version. Yes, there are definitely twists. I, I'm just not sure if they're nearly as effective as they want it to be. Mm. And I think it's partially because they go from small scale to without giving spoilers, very, very high... Well, just crazy very, and... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, Joe, what, what was your uh, thoughts on The Invitation? Well, it's definitely more of a thriller, but I could see some horror elements. I mean, the two often go hand-in-hand hand in terms of how you feel, and I think even the opening uh, kind of establishes we're heading into some pretty dark territory. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you With know, wolf. it's not the most... Uh, you know, off, I could say, for a definition. I think that the slow buildup actually really works for me. I think that there is a definite vibe of creepiness and strangeness, and you can definitely tell that there is some tension there, and I liked that. And I could tell that there already was going to be something uh, really intense and insane we're building up to. So the ending mm-hmm. didn't bother me. I thought that actually worked pretty well. It was just kind of like the tension and then the release. Uh, and I did think the characters were interesting, and a lot of it was kind of subdued, particularly the protagonist. I thought his conflict was pretty good and his relationship with this woman and how uh, difficult it was and how, uh, how much uh, there was in terms of dark secrets there. Mm-hmm. And you could kind of feel the tension. But I do kind of agree. One of the negatives for me for me was that kind of when we are getting set up in this party, meeting these characters and talking, it does seem kind of unnatural mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Like I'm thinking it feels like they're acting the way this movie's filmed, strange, so they're not acting with real people they're kind of yeah, robotic yeah. almost and and for a little bit i thought that was the actors but then when we tr- you know turn into the more thrillery aspects everybody seemed to be doing a good job so, so it's like yeah. those scenes maybe weren't yeah. directed quite as well but then again it worked for the tension so it kept you in that weird mood but i was, I was gonna say some of the some of the motivations and the way things play out quasi justify a few of them without without giving spoilers but others, not quite so much. A few of them, but everybody yeah. was kind of acting that way. A, a little bit, yeah. And so, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to really tell where that fell through. I think that was distracting through some of it. But uh, for the most part, I liked the build-up. I thought it was good. Mm-hmm. It was very, very uh, dark film. You know, not well, not exactly is. the lightest entertainment, for sure. Um, I, I'd but, almost call this cast the dark podcast if it wasn't for, like, one movie. Which Spock? Spock's not too dark. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't think so. Well, yeah, the, the slow belt actually reminded me of another movie that um, we were divided on earlier this year, and that was The Witch. Hmm. Um, mm. You know, you guys kind of liked that slow build up. I thought that in that film it was a lot more boring. There just, I mean, yeah, there was a couple of things that happened along the way, but it was a very, very slow build up. Here, I was never bored. I was intrigued by the characters. I was definitely intrigued by the mystery and the and the premise. Well, less uh, characters in that, that film. The witch, though, I guess, less of them. Yeah, that's true. true. But yeah, a very similar... Uh, group of, like, nine versus, like, group of five, four or five I think. Yeah. But yeah, similar. Kind of ending goes completely, you know, Yeah, insane. yeah, you know, in, in terms of, right, the first, like, three quarters of a it's movie like just being build up, pretty build up, slow, build up. and then... Oh, it's a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then things happen. Yeah. Reminds you of that, of that, like, four times, give or take? Yeah. Actually, yeah, this movie kind of was comparable to some of the, uh, like kind of weird thrillers we've reviewed over time like i think borgman i think blue ruin it's kind of got a similar oh, good old borgman, borgman it's probably got about that. this just reminded yeah. me a little bit of borgman in mm-hmm. some ways gotta bring up most that. of these are pretty good though i like they, them they're a little off but they're pretty yeah. good these uh i don't know these quirky little thrillers yeah but yeah no i thought it was a pretty well done movie i just kind of wish that it seemed a little more natural in some spots yeah Certainly towards the beginning. Towards the Definitely. beginning, like, you weren't really sure how to feel about also, it. Also, I get that this woman has a type, but these two guys looked an awful lot of, like, shave one of them or something. I think that's what they were going I for. I know it yeah. is, and it's fine, yeah. but... <laughs> but you were like, wow, she really it does look like her type. It took me a long time yeah. to figure out if she was in a room with somebody, unless she was, like, mentioning mm. oh, our dead son, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Hmm. I was like, now, is this her current man or the ex? Well, like, one of them does yeah. have a bigger beard. Uh, slightly, <laughs> slightly. But it's like yeah. you know, that's no, true. It's it's like the 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 man and the same man a week after not shaving. Yes. You know, oh, yeah, that's yeah, true. But so, you know, she's it's a reflection. I, I get what they were doing. No, no, it was no, just no, a little I'm confusing kidding. for uh, no, I, I a, little, a little time. But okay. yeah, it's fine. Uh, all right. So, Justin, what's your grade for the invitation? B. All right, it's B plus for me. It's an A minus for me. Oh, okay. Wow, that was pretty good. The whole scale there. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, well, so up next is my pick, uh, and that is Hunt for the Wilder People. This is now available on DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, this is an adventure comedy in which an abandoned 13-year-old delinquent boy, Ricky Baker, played by Julian Dennison, joins the family of Bella and Heck, played by the great 
Sam Neill. It's true. Bella is the only one who really gives Ricky the time of day, but when she dies early on, Heck decides that Ricky will go back into foster care. Unacceptable to him, he burns down a barn to fake his suicide and hides out in the woods with his dog. I know Joe would love this one, Tupac. Uh, you're right, definitely one of the best characters. <laughs> uh, and when Heck finds him in the woods, uh, he ends up hurting his own leg, so the two are forced to camp in the woods for a bit. And meanwhile, a search party from the state attempts to find them, and the story goes from there. Rachel House co-stars as the hard-nosed child welfare worker. Uh, this is a very odd movie. I saw the preview for this months and months ago. We had it here uh, in town at the local art house. Never ended up doing it for the show. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, when it came to DVD, I was I was noticing all the very high marks on Rotten Tomatoes, ninety eight percent, and I thought this has got to be a fresh one tomato. Of, well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a fresh a fresh uh, score. But I just thought, well, this has got to be interesting. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it from the trailer, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and it is interesting. But it's uh, a lot of things. It's funny. It's touching. Uh, it's certainly dramatic. There's some action sequences. Um, so I really got a lot out of this movie. I think the chemistry between, uh, Neil and Dennison is great. Uh, I like this kid a lot. I think he's very talented playing this kind of hard ass kid that's sort of been thrown in the system a lot. So you can sympathize with why he's the way he is. Neil, you never really get a good a reason good why, why he's such a D bag. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You just sort of kind of piece it together, you know, yourself, I guess, um, from hypotheses. Pretty much. Um, but I thought the humor was, was great. The uh, the welfare character, I mean, every scene she was in was great. She really uh, <laughs> no got the laughs fine. from me. But I, th- I think it's a good story. It reminded me uh, a little bit of, like, a mud. I mean, they weren't quite as lost of a, a kid as this one, but, you know, the sort of grizzled older person that's like well i don't really want you around but i guess you're here so we'll make the best of it Mm -hmm. um i thought the the cinematography was great it was directed by this dude uh who directed the green lantern among other things but yeah he's done a few (laughs) things Uh, that was the one that stuck out to me though was like okay that's this is a far cry from that wasn't it um what we do in the shadows guy yeah yeah what we do in the shadows was one of them as well uh, okay um there was another one that we did on the show that i think we all enjoyed but then he also did another like real bad one that i didn't like uh from years years ago called eagle versus shark so uh, he's he's obviously got um up and down you know a bit of a yeah mix but i would say this is far and away his best film i i really enjoyed it i got into the characters you know would would love to see more i mean what we do in the shadows is getting a sequel, you know. Yeah. I, I could see Essentially a sequel. spin-off too. All right, well, whatever it is, Werewolf yeah, for, okay. a second yeah. movie in the franchise. Yes, yes. You know, and, and I would love to see something with this. So, yeah, I liked it. What do you guys think, Joe? Uh, yeah, I liked it too. Yeah. yeah, I think that you're onto a lot of good things. There's definitely a lot going on. I, I wouldn't have thought mud. This kind of reminded me a little bit of like Wes Anderson stuff, like Moonrise Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, well, especially when they do the little chapters. Bit, yeah. yeah, some of the, the chapters, yeah. and some of the the fun, some of the the random quick cuts, some of the odd hijinks, the hijinks, and yeah, kind of a, a mishmash of everything. There's definitely a big love of movies with this one. I mean, mm-hmm. you've got so many references to other things. Well, and, very true. You no, know, for sure, you got Tupac. Terminator stuff and Tupac <laughs> and a lot of things. And one thing I liked about the movie, yeah, I did like the references. <laughs> so many references. Is you know, I'm like the Terminator, you're like Sarah Connor, you know, stuff like that. It was kind of fun. That was a good bit. I really liked, though, how the movie was shot in this perspective, like, how a child's mind works. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a lot like room in that regard, it's, it's, where it's really shot from the child's perspective the whole time. Like, you can, like, when they, he's pretending to have a gun, and he's got his own soundtrack in his mind. And That's you true. Can, you can tell it's really cheesy and it's quirky, but this is how it is, and it's it's choppy, and it's, even when he's dealing with more abstract concepts it's like he's got a grasp on it even if he can't completely describe it mm-hmm. and i think that, okay. that that subtle nuance is good even though the movie is really over the top in a lot of ways and i like the element of satire of how this i mean i guess it's almost commenting that maybe not a lot happens in new zealand if something like this can make these <laughs> these national, guys a national yeah. issue where you got like you know literally a manhunt with the police and even the mm-hmm. army after them it's it's pretty intense, and they meet some kooky characters, and yeah. but it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a good story, definitely good chemistry from them. Uh, there's really not too much wrong with it. The the only real negative that I could think of is that I do kind of wish that we knew a little bit more about Sam Neill's character. Mm-hmm. Like he, yeah. even by the end of the movie, I still didn't feel like I quite got him. 
but you know, definitely not. But still, overall, it was it was a pretty fun ride. I, yeah, I definitely think a sequel would be kind of awesome. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I sort of used Mud as a reference point, also for the fact that it was, you know, uh, an indie movie that nobody really heard of until that's true. They got like super super high marks on Rotten, and yeah. then everybody was like, "Oh yeah, Mud." That movie, yes. So so it's Mud Kingdom. True. Yeah. Or, Rise Mud or. Or the Grand Mud Hotel. The Grand Mud. Uh, nah, so they do live in the woods in the mud. I am. I am. Uh-huh. Curi- <laughs> okay. I am curious though. You said the great Sam Neill. Is he great because he has the beard now, or was he always great? Jurassic Park. Okay, Naturally. that's when. Okay. Great, great from Jurassic Park. Okay. Uh, Justin, your thoughts? <laughs> there is so so much love for this on Rotten and plenty of other movie review sites, and I just don't get it. Oh. So, what? The upset. Before I before I go any further, let me make this abundantly clear. I don't hate this movie. Okay. I don't. I just don't understand why people are proclaiming it like the best of the year. I think that's a ridiculous claim. It's up there for me, for sure. I liked it. I, I mean, here's the biggest issue for me. With, with the director's filmography, including things like What We Do in the Shadows, which I thought was pretty consistent with the, with the humor, a little on the short side, but it, it got its... It got its attendant cross, and I think it worked. This is so unbelievably scattershot with its humor that you'll go from gut busters to jokes that are completely lifeless in the time span of about two seconds. And it's maddeningly frustrating. The chemistry is there, and it's not. And it's partially because of the script, and it's partially because of Neil, I think. Whoa! I think oh it's my the, god, <laughs> what? I think it's, I think it's partially because his character is ridiculously underwritten, and I think it's also the fact that he's not able to be in, entirely up to, the, up to par. I think he seems, at times, like even he doesn't know what his character wants, and it speaks volumes to the script. Alongside that, I think the chapter selection hey. choice was... For lack of a better word, questionable. Hey, I thought that was cool. Oh, I thought it was fun. That was different. Okay, okay. If you're going to do chapters, don't do more than five. This movie has ten. Well, it's, it's based it, on a book. I assume each chapter is based on the book chapter. I'll be honest, Justin. That kept it moving. I was like, oh, there's another chapter. Boom. Let's, yes, but you know. even in this, it's like, okay, no. It's getting ridiculous. And right. like, and more importantly, it's like, okay, ten minutes, new chapter. Ten minutes, new chapter. Five minutes, new chapter. It's like, why? then why make it a chapter? If literally, like, two scenes happen, you're calling some, a new chapter. Some chapters are short. <laughs> <laughs> like, this, this movie needed a, needed a ruthless editor in the worst way. Mm. But but those shots of the scenery, man, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful movie. I don't know. Oh, no, I mean, it, it it captures the scenery well, and I do like I do like the escalation when it works. Like, when the humor's there, it's there in spades. There are, the first 15 minutes, if the rest of the movie was like that, it would be easy A, A+. Plus. I thought the... The problem is, the first... The first fifteen minutes happen, then they stop, and then you get the rest of the movie, and you never, and it's okay, but it's never as good as those first fifteen minutes. Oh man, the first no, part of the movie is the blo- darkest this part. This is blowing my mind. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. Okay. But like I said, I think I think it works in spurts. Sometimes sometimes it's there, other times I think it's completely off, and it never made me feel like I wanted to turn it off, but. But as a whole, I just think this was a very. This was this was a movie that just was not ready to, to come out into the world yet, and I think it really needed like another edit or two to really come to life. Hmm. No, I didn't find that. Uh, did the Ally McBeal uh, fantasy bits bother you? I like those. Uh, well, I know you did. I'm not Justin. Not especially. I mean, not especially. I think okay. that spoke to his character. It didn't work as well as, say, Morse from, Morse from America, which I think utilized it perfectly. But I think mostly just like the the comedy bits, Some sometimes it worked, sometimes it wouldn't. I think when it worked best, it was when they were playing up the whole absurdity of the situations that they were in. Mm-hmm. Like like the finale where they're literally being chased by the military is... No, it was great. Is, is definitely funny. But then you'll also get like little bits in between the in between that chase that just aren't. And it's like, okay, way to ruin a great physical physical scene. And I think that really that pulled it down significantly. Like, let the scene breathe. Let it actually let it actually play out instead of let's race to the next five hundred jokes. I thought it was excellent. <laughs> Justin, what's your grade for the Wilder people? B minus. It's an A for me. Well, I agree with you. I thought it was pretty gangster. It's an A. 
One of the year's best. I really enjoyed it. Uh, all right, so For the Love of Spock well, is with Joe. I mean, how could I synopsize? Now, we had the uh, the uh, Takei documentary two years ago on this yeah, very show. Yep. That's, that's true. On the, uh, the catch-up show. And uh, apparently this was being worked on by uh, Leonard Nimoy's son, who is the director. Mm-hmm. And it was being worked on before he died. And so you actually have expert excerpts of him interviewing his father. And there's actually some narration through it. But it happened, of course... After he passed, so it included more elements, apparently, of his life as well as the character of Spock. Mm-hmm. So, the documentary is really just two things. It's, I think, probably more focused, obviously, on the impact and importance of Spock, kind of a little analysis of his character, why people like him, and a little bit more about the man behind him. So, it's it's kind of doing both, and I think it does it well. I mean, I think um, there's definitely, right from the get-go, there's a lot of love, which I, mean, I could feel, yeah, personally. Well, sure. Like, of course. De- definitely. And then there's some, uh, that personal touch with... The relationship between the man and his father, I thought, was kind of a nice touch. Some even some things I didn't know about the struggle with his acting career, and uh, but you know, it, it's it's a it's a good documentary for sure. But I I feel like there was a little bit of um, too much of a reliance on certain things. Like really, in a lot of ways, it was kind of like the Spot Clip Show. Oh, like, without question. Like literally, I was thinking, you know, like there's so many. Uh, TOS episodes that you guys have and have not seen that they're just going to reference, and it's like that's a big part of the runtime. And I just kind of feel like there are a lot of excerpts, but nothing's really delved into quite as deeply as it mm-hmm. could be. Like, they cover all the bases. It flows well. It's enjoyable to watch. It's good. Uh, but I don't know if I'd say that it was fantastic. But does it, So it does not live up to the Takei documentary. <sighs> no. I, uh, the thing I liked about the Takei documentary is that it you, know, you learned a lot more about his, his facets of his life. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a much more personal look at the man. But then again, the man was alive, you know, so they had him. Yeah. And it was more focused on the actor rather than just the character. So maybe splitting it both yeah. ways maybe wasn't quite as much of a focus. I, I'm i glad it was a good thing on Spock. But I guess, I think it was, I think it's a good documentary for sure. But I guess for me, it was just telling me a lot of stuff I already knew. So on one hand, is this a documentary for the fans who appreciate this and know all this already? Or is it for people that might not appreciate it? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where the fine line was. I actually think it would have been better to really look even further into Nimoy's life, because having watched some interviews with him and his uh, his family and everything like that, I find that to be really interesting, too. And his mm-hmm. music, they cover a little bit as well. But I feel like that pushing a little more than in there took away from the Spock element. Yeah. So I know that's hard to juggle, but I could see it being a little uneven. But overall, I enjoyed it. It was it was good. Yeah. Justin, what do you think? Well, this is definitely the Spock clip show love letter to fans. That's what it is. And, I mean, let me, let me make this abundantly clear. That's not necessarily a bad thing. What kind of bugged me about this documentary was just simply that it really never goes much deeper than the surface level with that. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. There's some good observations here, and it's really, it really is fascinating hearing like diehard Trek fans give their give their thoughts and opinions about the character, what it means, what a what one character that just does a weird hand thing and says "live long and prosper" can really mean to someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really spoke volumes, and I I very much did appreciate that, and that. Fans go far beyond just simply, you know, somebody who watches Trek. It goes to other other show creators. It goes to actors. Jason Alexander's interviewed in this, and I, that yeah. threw me to a, threw a loop. Oh no, big Trek fan. Yeah, uh, as I figured from the uh, from the actual interview, but yeah, not one of those people I would instantly think, oh yes, major Trek fan. That's the point. But not necessarily a bad thing though. But I think that also speaks uh, volumes about just the nature of fandom as. As we uh, are, as we are in present day 2016. Mm-hmm. Though, like I said, I think where it sort of falls flat is, well, the, while some of the outside stuff is nice, while some of the, uh, and while some of the clips are very are very much fun, I think one of the best scenes in the entire documentary is, uh, uh, Nimoy at a convention, reading off one of the earliest Ripping reviews. Yeah. No. Uh, Ripping on Shatner as well and as reading the first uh, review, review of Trek. Trek. What, well, that's, what it, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah the riff on Shatner. And that was true. It's interesting. Uh, Shatner being described as wooden is uh, probably the most inaccurate thing you could say. Oh, it's, yes. It's definitely not wooden. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> These are not my words. That's, that was funny. Yeah. Uh, it, it proves that, like, yes, he, he could be a serious actor, but he also had a great sense of humor, which I very much do appreciate. I don't think it's nearly as hard hitting as To Be Decay, mm-hmm. but it's definitely got its moments, and I can very much appreciate that. 
Well, I agree uh, that it is not as strong as the Takei documentary, for sure. Um, my biggest issue with it... Clip show. Well, not, <laughs> not even necessarily that. Because we, it, it's not just the spot clip show. There's also clips of many of Nimoy's other you know, work in, in television and film, which I appreciate. But it is the, the directing from his son. Uh, I, I can appreciate that, look... Here is a love letter to my dad. Very proud. Work, though, with a competent director to yeah, tell the story. Do a collaborative effort here. Um, I, I thought some of it was just odd. In, in one scene, they have Jim Parsons as Sheldon from Big Bang Theory relaying a story about how Spock got the character of Sheldon through like this thing as a kid. It's like, this isn't even a real person. Like, if you want to interview Jim Parsons, fine. Well, yeah. I, I think that, which they did later. Yeah, well, later. yeah. No, they didn't. They interviewed the, the creators of Big Bang. That's true. But I feel like every time they interviewed Jim Parsons, he was being, he was as a no, le- no, Sheldon no, or whatever. No, there was yeah. that one segment where he was like, oh, you know, the you know the influence of this and trying to get out of character or something. About well, his maybe. acting method. Like, maybe it was one scene, but they were trying to show the influence of, yeah. you know, Spock on Big Bang Theory, I, I guess. That was odd i'll tell you the oddest one um uh, like there as an example that that is true um uh, there's a couple examples you're right like there, you know he usually tried to keep it consistent where he was interviewing himself right. or he was interviewing other people but sometimes people like oh yeah by the way and he cut back to himself and you're like okay wait a minute oh so this is him interviewing another yeah. person and the whole okay like the whole you know the with speaking of decay when he briefly talks about the homoerotic elements between kirk and spock which was interesting but it's just like oh yeah by the way i heard this yeah, yo, yeah, it's a thing, and then never talk about it. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you could spend a few more minutes it's on that. Yeah, like otherwise, just kind of. Or does it really need to be there? Like, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. By the way, but, you especially know. since it was kind of already covered in the Decay document. Yeah, seriously. So yeah, <laughs> even I thought though that was... it wasn't about Decay's character, but yeah. But no, it was um, worth talking about. I, you know, I, what gets me about this is, you know, look, Spock is probably in the top. I don't know five most identifiable television you know jerry seinfeld yeah, obviously I, is a real person etc um but even then is it I worth feel like doing a whole documentary on a on one character like i was thinking about it you know you could do a documentary on superman yeah, yeah. but there's so many avenues to explore because sure. a million people have played him you've got the comics you've got the um the tv shows you've got the movies you know here it's like one character who was played by the same man one on one show and then, of course, they did the movie series, and then, yes, they need a lot more on Nimoy himself. And I find it odd that before Nimoy's death, that all the documentary was going to be was about Spock. Hmm. I think that would have been just not nearly as good. Like I said, it's pretty much ground that's probably been covered a million other places yeah. at this point. Yeah, like, yeah, it's it's an important character. Yes, it was a major part of Nimoy's career, but there was there's so much... It seems like there was so much more to him than simply Spock. Well, yeah, and the best parts of the movie focus on... Nimoy as a father. Yeah, yeah. Nimoy as a friend. The story about the animated series where yeah. they didn't want uh, any more than three of the main stars to do the voices. Mm-hmm. And Nimoy said, well, that's not going to happen. I'm out. Yeah. You know? But and they he had that kind of clout that, okay, fine, we'll get everybody in. Yeah. You know, those kind of stories are where he would work all weekend so his kids would never have food on – would always have food on the table. Yeah. You know, even if it meant going – to do an all, all weekend thing in New York, you know, showing up on the Carol Burnett show to hawk soap or whatever. Yeah. I, I mean, that was the best part of the movie. The parts with Spock, all right, fine, but we got it. <laughs> we know yeah. about Spock. Of course. That's why I, I think the documentary really the like, doesn't Nemo. have focus because it was originally supposed to be all about Spock, which I think would have been a far inferior documentary to begin with. Certainly. Yeah. But, pretty much telling us stuff we already know right yeah. right right <laughs> yeah so yeah it's it's good it's worth a watch but uh a far cry from the decay i i think yeah absolutely yeah all right justin what's your grade uh b on this one yeah it's a b for me as well it's a b plus okay me. uh so finally is the whaling <laughs> that's with justin and that's not where they impale the whales uh, yeah it's not whaling like <laughs> with whales it's like oh! no no it's uh it's, it's like not star trek bones. 4 but mm-hmm Oh, they did talk uh, about Star Trek IV, yes. They did. Love a Spock. Director, yeah. <laughs> That's good, yeah. So, after a mysterious stranger, played by Jun Kunimura, arrives in a sleepy town, a string of disturbing incidents occur that may or may not be connected. Officer John Gu, played by Don Juan Kwok, begins his investigation, 
and the mystery takes a darker and argu and possibly supernatural turn, especially when his daughter gets involved. So, The Wailing is an epic horror film, but there's so much more under the hood, and I think that's why I, I like it. Now, granted, the epic running time is taxing. I'm not going to fight that even remotely, and that does yeah. impact a portion of my grade. How much of that, we'll talk. But it is, it is, uh, it is noticeable. However, what, what benefits that is the fact that there is some legitimate tension, and the way it's set up does allow for a, a solid mystery, a really interesting commentary on racism, a little bit of a ex exploration into the occult and some pretty freaky some pretty freaky scares not just simply jump scares but interesting aspects of POV as well as uh, as well as in regards to performances i have no problem saying this is the scariest thing i think we've re we've reviewed since we started and i think it's largely to the benefit of the cast the setup and a genuine amount of intrigue does a uh, are there some times that things don't necessarily work? Yes, but most most of the time they use that to benefit something else coming, usually to set the stage for a later moment. And it does really pay off in one really, truly dark and ominous conclusion. I, I, was, uh, I wasn't I was really sure what to what to think about this one going going into it, but I'm, I'm very glad I got the opportunity to check this one out and, and share it at the end of this season. Hmm. Um, well, I have a feeling I, I'm on the lower end of of this scale um so i'm interested to hear what joe has to say me mm -hmm. well i liked it i figure <laughs> you know, uh, i figure no uh, yeah i think i really like the the atmosphere and the mood in this one there's definitely an element of dark fantasy which i can appreciate it's very unique in that sense and i like that it kind of starts off with kind of one inciting incident to kind of intrigue you to different things and you're thinking oh is this connected to this and so you're already kind of trying to play with the concept in your head and they introduce little ideas here and there, and they tackle a lot of different things. And you're right, Justin, there's a lot of interesting experimentation with editing, and I think that the mood and setting work really well to establish some things. I think for horror, it's definitely very intriguing, and I do kind of like the conclusion. And you're right, it's very scary, but uh, it's also a bit slow at points, and uh, it's really it's really long. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a little too long, I'd argue, which is my biggest negative. But even so, I, I thought that there were some moments that were... Very creepy. I'm not gonna lie, and I, I really appreciate that. It's definitely one of the more unique horror films I've seen in quite some time. So I liked it. Okay. Yeah, I would say uh, the length really brought this one down for me. I mean, you could trim this easily by thirty minutes, hmm. and I don't think it would necessarily sacrifice that much of the story. I I do agree. There's a lot going on, mm -hmm. and it does sort of go off in a few different directions. Most of which I think are important for the story that they're telling. Uh, not all, but most. But this is honestly one of the movies where um, I sort of do need to base it a little bit more on the technique and the filmmaking aspect of it. Because uh, I was pretty bored with it. Hmm. But I agree that it certainly had scares at points. I liked, you know, a, a lot of the things that were happening. The acting was was very good, um, but the length really killed it for me. Hmm. It's definitely a slower movie. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I think the slow worked for the atmosphere. I I, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's more than moments. The length. Yeah, is, I think with the slowness. Of I it. think once it got around the halfway point, it started picking up the pace a little bit. But I mean, I will admit, early on, it's like you're interested, but you can tell oh, this is a the first half. It's a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit stop and start. Yeah, a little bit. Literally stop and start. Stuff happens and then, yes. wait, did it actually happen? <laughs> then there's other That's things that can twist that even further, but yes. Deeper, absolutely. No, yeah. it, but it's uh, it's an intriguing movie. It just, I think it, it could have been trimmed a little bit for sure. What do you think of uh, of Justin's comment? Because I was trying to think. Um, the scariest movie we've reviewed? Since on the show? I don't know. I personally, I mean, I always gave that it follows because I thought that was really disturbing. That it was follows is, and well, and Justin, you did not find that. I don't very think that movie scary. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know you didn't find which, it scary. Which, which, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think yes, it's definitely scary, no. scary. 
Well, I, I found this unnerving know. too, but I kind of find them synonymous. You know, if I'm unnerved, it's, it's a reaction. Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> well, and you brought up that point during It Follows. I mean, I think. It's a different kind of fear. Fear and, and scares all sort of. Coalesce. Well, the, yeah, they, they get lumped in with sort of that, you know, you uneasy feeling. Zombie fear, uh, yeah, ghost I don't fear, know. alien yeah. popping in your so chest. I, I think that's a part of it. Different fear. Um, this is certainly more of a visceral. Yeah, uh, certainly, yes. You know, fear. For me, I think it might be the first conjuring. Yeah, Conjuring mm, that has That really some, scared the hell out of me. I'm mean, crying in the theater. Well, Conjuring was, had some scary moments. Yeah. But, but I also thought... That it, might be mine. It was... It's a little more generic yeah. than this, certainly. Yeah. yeah. And I can, you know, I can admit that. I mean, heck, you know, Green Room had parts of it that were scary, and that's not technically horror. True. I was going to say, that one I legitimately don't think is a horror movie. Except... Uh, well, uh, see, I would say that's more horror than The Invitation, for sure. Hmm. Well, on that we can agree. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, it's, it's interesting, if nothing else. Uh, Justin, what's your grade for The Wailing? Uh, certainly. Uh, I leave The Wailing with an A. All right. It's a B-plus for me, but again, mostly on the technical aspects of it. Joe? A-minus. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, well, that will wrap it up uh, for the DVD show. Um, you can check out uh, all of those. I believe all of them are on DVD. The Invitation and the Wailing are on Netflix, yep. uh, instant streaming, if yeah. they're not on DVD for some reason. And uh, Joe, uh, winding down the year on the Merlin Channel, I noticed you did a new uh, news update the other day about all the new trailers that are out. Mm-hmm. That was very interesting. Uh, and you can check that out. You can uh, subscribe, of course, to Joe's Merlin Channel or our channel here, mm-hmm. uh, the Twitter feed at Film Fanatics Pod and the uh, Facebook group. Film Fanatics with an exclamation point. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here next time.